Um, for me, I'll redefine it as what are the detours for me? Like what were the things I had not expected um, that ended up happening for me? And in retrospect, I think of it as nervous breakdown. So my first year, I grappled with, uh, not I grappled with, I had a nervous breakdown. And uh, I read a beautiful quote. I wish I had my journal here where I could open it and say, sometimes a nervous breakdown is just a way that your body is speaking to you. Um, for like, And it's warnings that it would have given you earlier, but you do not, you fail to listen to them. So I think the pressure, um, first, this is a new country you're living in. Um, you, there's a pressure of, you, of being the first person. Uh, so like the first person was doing it in, in from your family, in your community. I had almost 30 people take me to the airport when I was coming to the UK. <laughs> I can see. 30, 30 people, like almost yeah. 30 people. The entire and village. The entire village, you know? Yes. So, yes. So like when when I when I'd be sitting down and I'm writing an essay and it's just just coming up. It's not an essay just for me. It's my it's an essay for Kenya. It's an essay for Nairobi. Yeah. For the people who brought me to the airport. You know, yeah. all these thirty people. Hi Ruthie. Welcome to the podcast. Asante for making time. Thanks, Clarice. I'm honored and happy to be here. Sawa sawa. I know you're currently in the UK. How is the weather over there? Actually, it's getting better. Uh, we're heading into spring. Um, I've not stepped out. Okay, I stepped out today. It's sunny and cold. Um, coming clear fridge, um, so hot and cold, but we're grateful. All right. But let's jump in and talk about what are you currently doing in the UK? What is your what is your day-to-day role? Paint a picture. like when Just the name of the role, first and foremost, and then just paint a picture of what it is like, what do you do? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm working, though most people who meet me here think I'm studying um, because it's a student city, really. Um, and the academic man- manager for the Refugee-Led Research Hub, this is an initiative of the Refugee Studies Center at Oxford's Department of International Development. And um, my role entails coordinating all the academic programs, coordinating, designing, leading, um, of course, with colleagues, um, all the academic programs for the Refugee-Led Research Hub, which, again, is an initiative that reaches out to students and uh, researchers who have a lived experience of displacement from all over the world. Mm. My week looks like 9 to 5, um, 9 to 5 or 9, nine to 4 sometimes, uh, uh, work days and work, 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 work. And then, um, but my day starts pretty early on. I do lots of writing and my side hustles early in the morning. And evenings, I spend time with friends, attending lectures or exercising. Yeah. Ah, great. And now that you talked about Oxford, you remember when I was, we were talking and I was sharing that I'm really inspired by the fact that by was it by 24 years you had was it by 24 years you had two masters from oxford i by 25 yeah by 25 yeah do do you actually pause and think about that uh, achievement do you do you actually see it as an achievement um not as much as i'd love to um, but it's people around me who remind me um, to take time to reflect on it being a big feat, actually. Um, and I think I probably forget it because everyone here is doing it. So you almost feel like everyone else everywhere is doing it. Yeah. But then just so that maybe so that we appreciate, so that you appreciate and our audience appreciate, Maybe we roll back all the way to where you grew up. Because I think it's only when you reflect back to where you grew up, the schools you attended, the challenges you had academically and and outside academics, then I think you actually can easily appreciate what what you've been able to achieve at your age. So let's go back to where it all started. Do Do you mind sharing about where you were born and raised? Uh, I know it's somewhere in Nairobi, and, yeah. and then touch about touch about where you were born and raised, 
um, about family life, anything, anything memorable from those days. And then we will go to briefly to, to academics, starting from primary school, and then we'll continue from there. Sure. Let me, let me make an attempt. So I was born and uh, bred in Nairobi, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, where exactly? Upper Hill. But we moved quite a lot. Um, one thing that stands out about my childhood and growing up is, uh, first, my mom is a teacher. Um, and from her own personal experiences, which she openly shares with us, um, didn't have an easy childhood growing up. She endeavored to give us a beautiful childhood. So um, up until a certain point of my life, I feel like I was shielded from understanding the difficulty that they might have been going through, or um, I should be saying we might have been going through. Um, my childhood uh, is defined by books. It's defined by radio. And it's defined by storytelling. So, of course, because mother is a teacher, we had to read by fire by force and fire she had this thing of like when she'd get this um and right now in, in retrospect i think it's brilliant students who she was teaching and she'd find them reading novels or books as she's teaching she'd take the books and um like bring them to us and tell us this book needs to be returned tomorrow so you have to finish it. And it it got to a point where I would uh, negotiate with her. Mom, please, 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 please. I need more days to finish it. So, and, um, so grew up reading a lot and doing it at a fast rate because we had to return the books. And uh, she also read to us, which was beautiful. Um, previously, I used to think of this as a uh, lack. So grew up in a place which was quite remote. No electricity. No amenities that... Um, that's right now like the dire or must-haves. So our childhood was replaced by building stories and telling ourselves stories to sleep and listening to radio. So uh, I remember those programs we used to time at 7, 7 p.m. they were starting. So we'd gather together uh, uh, close, close to the radio and listen. Yeah, I don't know that I'm covering what my childhood looks like Um but as I was reflecting before I didn't, uh, before we started this session, much of my childhood was classified. And um, if I could give a summary of it was play. I played a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And it's funny when growing up, I never used to ask for permission. So I was the rowdy one. I almost led my siblings to doing what was considered wrong. But I miss those days. And I think I'm, I'm at a point in my life where I'm working towards reclaiming that childhood. Yeah, that's mm. me. Yeah. You know, that is really interesting because when I was writing and reflecting about my childhood, and many people ask me, so with the accomplishments, the little I have accomplished, they ask me to kind of reflect back to the academic journey. And it's very interesting you mentioned exact word that I normally use to summarize my primary school days, which I think you were, what you were describing, and it's play. And we were mm -hmm. playing a lot. But mm -hmm. I think the only difference between your story and my story is that we, I didn't read. And I think it's just <laughs> <laughs> it's the environment I was in. And as you know, um, to look at Naongi about it uh, the other day, Reading kind of came really late, and it was um, for me. I, I think around tw twenty seventeen, and I've been obsessed. Uh -huh. test. And I regret why I, we didn't start early. So I'm 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 envious always. Now what we they started um, this reading culture early early on. I'm interested to know, Ruthie. Do you uh -huh. think? And the question I'm asking, if at all, uh, parents and guardians and mentors are listening, and they have a kid in primary school, I'm curious to know those things like uh, listening to radio, like uh, those educative programs, or playing, or in your case, reading a lot, or the influence of your parents, of your mom being a teacher. Do you think it plays a role in who you become later on in life, career-wise, and things like those? I think it does. I think it does um, in a really great way. 
an example is I was reflecting again with my mom um, some days ago. She's still a teacher. They normally say teachers have such a long like trajectory and they stay the same. That's what her students normally say. Anyway, she was telling me that the difference she's seeing in kids um, in, in like currently in this generation, like they know how to express themselves beautifully. They can speak really good English compared to like kids she was teaching, um, let's say 20 years ago. But she's surprised at the fact that most of them can't, can't write yet or they haven't like it's expected at a certain age they should be able to like spell words correctly they should be able to write sentences correctly but they haven't and her hypothesis is she thinks it's the multimedia that they're being exposed to so lots of tv and um lots of screen time which I am not out here to like condemn screen time. Again, I'm a single woman, no child yet. I'm not out here to condemn screen time by any cha- by any bits. But she's saying, ah, there's an art that is being lost, the art of reading. Um, and I think it's something also which um, I, I once read an article by Chimamanda and she was saying uh, with social media and with the bite-sized information that we're receiving right now, we are losing our ability to be able to read long form pieces of work. So our minds have been trained to take in only small pieces, small pieces, small pieces, captions really, or subtitles. Yeah. Anyway, to respond to your question, I definitely think mentors and people around us definitely influence how uh, our reading and also influence how we turn out. Yeah. And I'm not, I don't want to place this on parents only. I think. The people around us influence that, yeah, at all stages of life, more so growing up here. Yeah. All right, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I think I agree. I agree. I, I agree with, 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 with that a lot. Mm-hmm. Now, what was the name of your primary school? Ooh. Um, that question. I went to so many primary schools. Okay, <laughs> I'll give a shout out because I spent. The school where I did my final high, primary school exams in, I only spent close to one and a half years there. Okay. So, um, I think it was just a passing, passing phase for me. All right. But you can mention two. Mm-hmm. I can mention two. No <laughs> um, worries. I can mention two. Uh, there's a school called El Shaddai. Um, they're still there. They're doing really greatly right now. It was so small and. We used to go to, we used to, the, our teachers used to, really good teachers, dedicated. They used to get us to class by around six, we were settled. And so it was dark. Our parents, or, or at least they had a sibling, so we'd walk and we'd gather together with other schoolmates and then we'd walk together because it was quite a distance. And the school yeah. didn't have electricity, so they used to have lanterns or pressure lamps and or sometimes the teachers some students are really innovative so they'd make these lamps that use tiny lamps uh that make them that use uh you use medi- medicine bottles the brown medicine bottles get a hole at the lid and put in like a week week the stove ones and kerosene so it's called koroboi so we'd use this and Man, reading never felt beautiful. I enjoyed solving math questions then. I think it's one school which shaped my debating skills, shaped my... I still played a lot when I was there. Um, And definitely Utawala High School, Utawala Primary School, where I finally did my um my um national exams. That school um introduced me to a different... Uh, phase of life so um it's there that i met students coming from really high economic backgrounds that's why i tasted pizza for the first time and i still clearly remember how pizza tastes tasted that time (laughs) it was something so exotic for me um yeah also a really beautiful place (laughs) all right yeah thank you for sharing and I, I I normally like um I'm sure they are proud of you like with whatever institution you you went to and I think um it helps to shout out uh, just so that because I I don't know I feel like sometimes most teachers especially in those small schools or in some of our schools they don't really sometimes they don't see 
I don't know, immediate results of what they are doing. So hopefully mm-hmm. when they see you shining out there, um, they, they'll, they'll, they'll pause and, appre- and, and appreciate uh, the work they are doing. We, we can go to high school. So uh, do, you, do you mind sharing what, what grade did you get from your KCP? And the reason why I'm asking, mostly, I'm trying, I'm trying to get so less because I scored... <laughs> I scored less than 300 marks. I'm not going to say what marks. And I'm always looking to see, number one, just to try and get solace, to see if there are people who scored almost same marks as, as I scored. But also, just, just to appreciate how life changes and that there is really no condition that is permanent, that whatever mm-hmm. you scored, whether, whether, whether you passed or you didn't really pass in uh, KCP, that somehow you can navigate through life and you can make something out of it. So if you are open um, sharing uh, what you scored in uh, KCP and where did you go for your high school? Sure. So for my KCP, I scored 387 out of 500 marks. And then I got um, an admission to Moi Girls School, Nairobi, where I, by the time I was finishing, I scored B plus. Yeah. All right. Um, mm-hmm. Tell. So in, I, I want, I want, I want us to to pause and reflect to that time in in high school, just for the sake of people who will watch um, the students in high school, in case they'll watch this episode. What 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 do you remember the most from high school? Number one. And number two, what would be your pieces of advice for any student uh, who is currently, think of that form one or think of how you were in form one and then when you are exiting in form four. So yeah, tell us about those those things. I think I remember high school as a place of growth. Growth. I grew physically. I went in when I was still a girl. I feel like I left when I was a young woman. Um, uh, I growth intellectually, um, growth in terms of expression. One thing I'll forever be grateful for for my girls' school Nairobi was uh, it's it's like a, it was like for lack of a better word boot camp. Because <laughs> it had its moments too. I like the wording. Yeah, yeah, it had its moments too, but it's a place where, like, it's like we're being conditioned and trained to become strong women. And one thing I remember people would tell us is, ah, girls from my girls know how to fully express themselves. Like, we can talk and talk and talk. We were loud. And uh, it was a space that encouraged it. I saw it in my friends, um, embrace that. I did embrace that too. I used to be quite fearful by the time I joined my girls, but by the time I left, um, that that was replaced with confidence in terms of expression. Um, yeah, really beautiful moments. I haven't taken time to fully reflect. Uh, maybe it's been a while since I did that to just fully reflect on my time there, but it definitely did shape my now. Yeah, it was a place of becoming. Yeah. All right, I li- I like the yeah. choice. I like I yeah, I think I think that makes sense. And also, yeah. I don't know if it's because at the time when we are in high school, we are also at the point where we are growing a lot, uh, physically, mm-hmm. mentally, and all that. And so it makes sense. It makes sense that it was a lot of growth happening there. Yeah. Is there any? Do you have any negative memory from high school? Mm. What time did you guys used to wake up in the morning? Five a.m. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think we needed to leave the gates you the gates would close around six AM. Six AM or five forty five. I forget. I was a school prefect, so I, I used to have house prefect actually, not not school prefect. So I was a captain for a specific house and yeah, the days which should I, I wonder why my mind forgets uh, such memories, but the I, I had weeks when I was on duty and it was my task to close the gate. Yeah, so I, I, I would close the gate ruthlessly. <laughs> yeah, so 5 a.m. Okay, 
Because mm-hmm. I, I think we were we were talking we were we were just conversing with someone the other day and I think their their worst uh, memory from high school was uh, waking up very early in the morning. And when and, and we were we were I don't know some part of me sees I I see this I see the sense uh, for that early waking up, uh, but also some part of me is like it's too early at that age. But anyway, I think it's a discussion for another day. So okay. Yeah. Um, let's move on swiftly to, uh, so you, at this time you are only in one school, Moy Girls. Yeah. Yep. So we shout out to Moy Girls Nairobi for Definitely. giving you a bootcamp experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah, yeah. So, so Ukatoka Moy Girls, you went to USIU? Yes. I. How did that happen? Why didn't you? Because USIU is a private uni, right? Mm-hmm. So I know most of my friends went to public um, public unis, and mm-hmm. at that time, the only thing I knew was uh, that time I think it was called Jab. Now it's it's Coops. You just mm-hmm. applied. Uh, you applied for courses and some universities you liked, and mm-hmm. then you waited for Jab to call you, kind of thing. W- where did did you get the idea of a private uni? How did you apply and all those things? And then also, and while you are while you are describing this, I want you to have um, that student in form three, form four, who is about or actually recent graduate thinking about uh, unis and things they should have in mind um, or even opportunities they should be looking out for. Yeah, um, certainly. Um... Why USIU? So yeah. I think I love transitions. I love leaving a certain like profound and defining period of my life to enter something else. So for me, finishing high school was a se- brought me a sense of relief, but also it brought me a sense of excitement. I feel like it was the first time I was able to embrace curiosity in my living. So I wasn't quite certain about what I wanted to do. I followed my interests little interest at that point at that point i remember telling my folks i want to be in a course that will enable me to speak to read and elements of travel i didn't know what that was (laughs) um anyway so i had the grades that would take me to a public university yeah directly really good grades i'd say so I, my parents wanted me, my mom, my mother particularly wanted me to do a business related course, you know, it was more marketable, like, yeah, sure, assured worth. I, however, did not select anything she had suggested. I got, I got called to Moy University in Eldoret to study a BA in psychology. Um, but at the same time, following my interests of talking, writing, speaking, and traveling, I applied for a scholarship at USIU and I got a f- full tuition fund uh, for my three and a half years. And USIU was my go to and my choice. Yeah. International relations. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that is interesting. So I have follow up questions on that, mostly mm-hmm. because, and I'm trying to force myself to mm-hmm. go back to after Form 4. Mm-hmm. I was helping my nephew and, and and a couple of students that I mentor to select mm-hmm. courses. And there is, I don't know, I feel like there is always this, because uh, Form 4, I feel like is really pivotal point, because then you can end up choosing, a, I don't want to say wrong career, um, but whatever you, you settle, you will be doing that thing for like three, four, five years, and it will definitely like change your course so mm-hmm. i wanted to to know um do you ever think if you had not gotten the scholarship to usiu do you ever think about the parallel life you would have as a psychologist if you had taken the psychology course and then number number two number number two is what would you advise I, I don't know if Coops is still open, but I think maybe they is recently closed. But for those, um, for for students, even those who are currently in Form 4, considering courses to take in uni, what should they be thinking about? 
should they follow interest? And I like the fact that you were, I like the fact that you were looking at, uh, you was particular about things that will allow you, you open to any course that will allow you to speak, to read and to travel. And I really like that. But then yeah. speak to that parallel life of yours, if you had not gone to USI to do international relations. And then what would you advise parents, guardians, or whoever helping those students to, or even the students them, themselves as they choose which course they want to pursue in uni? Um, parallel life. Funny thing is, I just have never pictured myself at Moi University doing psychology. And no hard feelings to Moi University. I think I'd have loved it if I'd gone there. Um, but maybe it's because it was clear from uh, the beginning that my my mother is such a force. My 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 father encourages lots of independence, so uh, won't really meddle so much into your decisions. Will guide wherever whatever you choose to do. But my mother had already made suggestions around uh, Bcom. Like I don't know who sold that idea to her. She's also good with her own research. <laughs> And she also, uh, like, if it was parallel that I would have wanted to go into law, like, they could have done their best, yeah. But I've never imagined a parallel life doing, uh, being in psychology. And the funny thing is, uh, I I see myself, though, at some point in my life, might study something related to psychology. So maybe it's... Maybe I'll leave that alternative life at some point. Yeah. So maybe if I didn't get into SIU, I'd probably do become. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that Bachelor of Commerce, amen. Oh, I'd have struggled. <laughs> okay. But do you know, I, I somehow can actually see you as a psychologist. What makes you say that? I, I think you have a way of easily transporting yourself into other people's shoes and you can empathize with their situation. I don't know how you do that, but I, I feel like you have a very easy way. Your friends, I'm sure your friends will tell you. You might not know. You might not see it for yourself, but I am one of one of your friends and I'm sure some of your friends will tell you. But I think you can easily transport yourself to someone someone else's shoes. And I think that yeah. is a uh, that is a that is a characteristic or a value um that you need for you to feel what the other person is feeling or like their thought process and then hopefully guide them through whatever they are going through. So I can really see you as a psychologist. But anyway, that that is a parallel life and maybe you will pick it up later as you speak, travel and read. <laughs> um um I, I I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. And um shout out to my almost and uh, uh, almost boyfriends. Um they're the ones who've given me the compliment that I give therapy vibes. But hey, anyone who's yeah. listening, please don't follow that as a sense of advice. It could be trauma bonding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. You asked me a, a, another mm -hmm. question. Um, another question is I want to so I I was also there. And actually, the, and the reason why I'm asking is, unlike you, okay, maybe I knew, I don't know if I knew what I wanted to do, but I was following, I was, it was purely influenced from my brothers. They had studied engineering yeah. and I had kind of seen them enjoying engineering. They talked about maths and physics and sciences in a very easy, easy, nice way. And somehow mm -hmm. kind of, um, I fell in love with sciences mm -hmm. and engineering through my brothers. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if I, I did not know so much about other courses, uh, but mm -hmm. again, I think the power of influence from your mm -hmm. siblings, people close to you. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, so for me, I chose engineering mostly because of um, influence from my brothers, but lucky for me, I've really enjoyed it thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And if I was to go back, I'd still choose engineering. Mm -hmm. But then um, for, for people, for students who are really confused, They've, they've passed or whatever grade they've gotten, they are not sure. There are so many courses. Like when you log into to the portal where you choose your course and therefore your uni, there are so many courses. And I feel like it's a bit overwhelming sometimes. And so I was asking, what do you think? 
just personally, your personal opinion, what should they consider when they are choosing a course or, or a uni? Because uh, I think you have a power of hindsight um, years later. Yeah, I think those are two different questions, courses and universities. Oh. So when choosing what you want to do, definitely you can't be blind to the influences that are around your life. So in your case, for example, you talk about having brothers who are in the natural sciences. Is that how they say engineering? Anyway, yeah, um, physical Let's sciences. Science. Yeah, yeah, physical sciences. Like, um, So there's already that influence which was there in your life. So you want to look at that also and see how, like whether that calls you or not. You also want to look at things that come easy for you at that moment. Uh, again, I have a really amazing friend um, who, she's slightly younger, actually not slightly younger, she's almost 10 years younger, but I like how she says, at this moment, my my mind isn't fully developed yet. I, li- I like the self-awareness. So what, acknowledging yourself, your, your curiosities and interests at that point, but also leaving room to realize that you're still there's still so much growth that is to happen. Even for me, like at the moment, I'm not, I'm not fully there yet. I, I say I'm, I'm still developing. There's still so much I don't know. So leaving room for that. And I have an unconventional approach when it comes to undergraduate. My approach is, I think it's a stepping stone into what you really want to do. So I don't think the three or four years should be like, fully like fully fully like defining what your life should be or turn out to be i think for me would um and the, my advice perhaps will not relate to everyone but for someone who finds this relatable to them for me would be choose something choose something that aligns with things that come easy for you interests that come easy for you and then use it as a space um whatever that would be, use it as a space for you to further look at what interests you, to further dig deeper into like an exploratory phase, to try out as much as you can. I think that's where graduate school comes in, to further follow the interests that you have developed when you're in an undergraduate. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't stress so much into I must be this and this. You can be so many things in your life. At least if there's one thing studying abroad has made me realize is you can shift your compass as many times as you like. Only that our society is not used to us doing that. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I and and actually yeah. I'm I'm itching to talk about so recently yeah. I've been reflecting a lot about the power of taking detours mm-hmm. and embracing curiosity. Because mm-hmm. if you are curious, you mm-hmm. tend to derail, or what people call derail. You tend to, you tend to, and especially if you have um, many interests. So, I'm happy you touched on that, and I really like, I really like that idea because I feel like at that at that point, if I go back to end of high school when you're choosing which course to take, and it feels like it might be the end of the world, and I feel like sometimes. Mm. A lot of pressure from parents or people around mm-hmm. you, and they want these sexy courses. Um, and but, but anyway, I like it. So whether whatever course you take, you should take something that comes. You should embrace something that um, kind of feeds into your interest and comes easy, and then mm-hmm. um, take it as a stepping stone. Yeah, yeah. It's not the end of life. You can you can switch, and also and and also being open minded that you can switch things um, even after undergrad. Even after grad school, mm-hmm. the USIU was your undergrad. Anything interesting from uh, USIU? Did you fall in love? And anything that is not, <laughs> I I don't want this to I don't want, I don't want this to sound like you know too too formal and it's books and books and books and reading and traveling. Can we talk about social life? Ooh, I see where you're heading to. Um, if and perhaps you're... maybe. <laughs> uh, I'll ask. I'll pose the same question to you after I respond to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think social life can take different many different ways, and so I fell in love with community work. And, oh, uh... you are making me. <laughs> 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 
I fell in love with um a boy. Okay. The um and then I fell in love with community work and okay. the people I was serving. Um if there's one thing undergraduates enabled me was flexibility. I remember feeling it first came in as a sense of frustration, feeling like I'm not being challenged enough. Like I have so much time on my hands. And I remember almost beating myself up for not being able to secure a job that I could actively do something that could be bringing me income. I remember looking at my friends with some sense of wonder and also, I don't say jealousy, not jealousy really, I really admired them. But finding myself unable to like do the same, like I had friends who had businesses that were flourishing. I had friends who were able to secure jobs and earn. Like, I don't know why that didn't happen for me, but now in retrospect, I am redefining what jobs look like. I'm redefining what paths look like. So for me, I taught, uh, I used to tutor. So I used to tutor kids and uh, who are both in high school, primary school, and I'd get some little cash here and there. I also used to, I, I fell in love with the community work. So my friend, um, Vini Gisore, we, uh, who founded the um, Out of the Streets Foundation, uh, brought me along as a co-founder. And man, did we do work. We reached out to so many street kids in Nairobi and built a community um, there, bringing together other young people from different universities, from our places of worship. And we'd gather together and offer so much mentorship and service to these kids that we worked with. Um, that was a defining part of my social life. Um, it took me a while within USIU to like open up I, I was a flower that slowly opened up so it took me time before I found friendships but I eventually did um shout out to my friend who I haven't been in touch with in a long while but Wilberforce Mutuma my best friend um uh and a group of many other friends actually people who are really defining for me um yeah I don't know whether that answers your question but how am I forgetting to a master's sorry I found yeah. another community. I joined to Masters, I think, in my second year of undergraduate. How did I stumble on Toast Masters? I think the beauty with USIU is like I'll call them gentle giants. You can be in class with someone who's very famous. And for me, that used to like really excite me. So I forget her name, but she'd given a beautiful TED talk. And I remember her giving a shout out to Toastmasters. Long story. Um, and I think they call it serendipity, either serendipity or another word which I'm forgetting, synchronicity. The moment you find out about one thing, it keeps on happening. So I found out about the TED Talk. She gives a shout out to Toastmasters. I see Toastmasters on Nation Breakfast uh, TV or something. After that, I see one of the people who was giving the talk in school. I say hi to her. She mentions a club. I join the club and I meet a group of incredible individuals who are focused on growth, self-empowerment, becoming better speakers. And that was a forming community for me too. So that's what my social life looked like. Yeah. Boys. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> we'll skip that. But thank you so much. For bringing thank you so much. I'll, we, we'll, we'll revisit. I'll not forget. But okay. thank, you, thank you so much for, for bringing all those uh, out-of-class activities that you did. Um, I'm curious to know, asking, um, the reason why I'm asking this, we were discussing, actually just today, we were discussing with a friend, and I was, a, I was asking, personally, I feel like I did so much in undergrad, but I feel like I, I wasted so much opportunities at the same time. And I'm happy. Um, I feel like campus has so much to offer. And then mm -hmm. you see single, at least most people, like less responsibilities, um, less, less, less things, not, not so much to lose. And so it, it kind of gives you a, a fertile ground to experiment with all sorts of things. And I feel mm -hmm. like I, I missed so much on that. Although I was mm -hmm. doing sports, I was mostly in track and soccer, and leadership mm -hmm. but then at the same time i feel like 
I didn't really maximize opportunities that campus had to offer. Because again, mm-hmm. I feel like I was very conventional and careful. And mm-hmm. I was doing what took me to campus, at least what, uh, what what my mom had told me to go and study and bring good grades. And I think I was mostly doing that. But also campus has so much. Uh, number mm-hmm. one, if I was just to mention the networking, mm-hmm. like uh, the kind of friends you can make from campus, people mm-hmm. who can help you achieve your dreams uh, later on and all that. So I'm, I'm curious yeah. to know when you are doing all these things. So actually two questions. When you are doing all these things, Toastmasters and out of the streets uh, volunteering work, was it, I, I'm curious to know, like, what aroused that? Like, was it something, were you intentional about seeking opportunities to grow outside class? Um, or, or what was it? What led you to seeking those? And I, I know you, you did m- much more. You even traveled abroad. And I think you should touch on that. Um, oh, and yeah. Number two, do you think, like me, do you think do you think there is something more or different you could have done or you would do if you were to go back to USIU now? Oh, good question. Uh deep reflection there. Um what drove me? I think I was learning, I was growing also in class. So I did international relations. Uh, my concentration was in diplomacy. I was almost carving out a path for myself, like becoming a diplomat, getting into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about how the detour happened and I'm here uh, running academic programs and not in like New York or the UN. Um, but what drove me was what you we were learning in class. So there's lots of reflection into history and like studying like, studying how the university in itself had morphed as a space of learning and as a space of political influence. And I also read, it was also in in university where I took up a reading challenge to read more Black women. And one of my professors and mentors influenced this. She's an African-American uh, woman. So she'd bring me books from her library. She introduced me to the likes of Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, and um and many others and these are women and works that I met in class that questioned my going to class, reading, studying, eating, going home. I felt like I could be doing more. Like people at my age were trailblazing. People at my age, I felt they're the ones who triggered independence in our country. Uh, They're the ones who, by the time the likes of Tom Boyer and the others were going for all these conversations and negotiating with the British government um, in our newly formed country, they were really young. And I I remember feeling, challenging myself and saying I could be doing more. So for me, it came from a point of learning and growth, but also feeling like I was not living to my full range I was not exploring as a, as much as I could have been doing. So that definitely influenced me seeking out more. And now that I'm looking back, I've always had, I think I've defined myself as a perpetual learner. Curious, wanting to know, wanting to learn. So also seeking to do more. Yeah, seeking to do more came from a place of wanting to learn. I did also a diploma in project management when I was in undergrad. Oh Lord, where did they get what? all that time? Anyway, <laughs> so, <Wow. laughs> so coming to the other question on, are there things I could have done differently if someone was to take me to um, undergrad? I think socially, yes. So I could, I was looking at Instagram the other day and they were showcasing like cu- cu- the cultural week, you say cultural week, it was such a big thing, you know, like the parties once in a while. I didn't show up for them. Yeah. I, I don't know why. Of, okay. I actually know why. Yeah. Um, yeah. Church, I was pretty religious. Um um, and that influenced what partying looked like and influenced what social life looked like for me. But, yeah, if there's something that changes, attend Culture Week and spend nights out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Before Nisa How, I, I'm mm-hmm. curious. Cause, so, every time 
every time um, every time I, I talk to students, uh, something that I like to do, I love to do, they, they keep asking and people are fascinated about how did you get this scholarship that gave you like full scholarship to Oxford. So even before before we go to road scholarship and after undergrad life after undergrad, how did you get to know about the scholarship that took you to USIU? Oh, my sister studied at USIU also. Um, she did um, accounting, okay, and finance. But anyway, so I remember her telling me about her friends. She had a beautiful group of friends who. And she'd mentioned how they find uh, uh, international relations and the travels that they are doing, the engagements that they're doing. And I remember feeling, wow, you know, I was that age where your sister is like everything she's doing. She's five years older, like looks much more glamorous, looks much more better. So her friends were people I looked up to. So that that did influence me. Um, but... When I mentioned I wanted to go to SIU, it was almost out of question because that place, the school is really expensive. Um, yeah, already my sister being there was, a, uh, it was pulled and stretched the family in such an immense way. And I had like grades that would have taken me to a public university and inexpensive. So it was almost out of question me going to SIU to be funded by family. But my sister was doing work study and knew or understood some scholarships which are there. So she kept me on toes. The scholarship is open, apply. And funny thing is, we don't really joke about this, but she contributed 99% to me getting that scholarship. Yeah. So how? pushed. How? How did she do it? Yeah. So she pushed, she pushed me with the application also. Uh, also with um submitting it so we had it was that time we were it wasn't online so things were online yes but most of the things were handwritten so she took me to USIU to drop them at the finance office we get to the finance office and you're told oh you filled the wrong document you do not have the application cover letter and I froze. I didn't know where to start from. And they were kind enough. They're like, just go find a seat uh, somewhere in the campus and write. So me, I'm freezing out there. My sister is like, sit, write me ideas, give me points. And she started drafting the letter, you know. <laughs> and she was like, okay, this is what, like, she, she was doing, the, she, was, she was researching online, coming up with a body for it. Once she did that, I felt unlocked and took the paper and sat down and wrote it was easy also because I had already done like 90% of the application itself. So the 10% where I froze is where she sort of held my hands and enabled me to finish the application. So yeah, th that, that's how I landed on USIU. Yeah. Okay. And funny thing is I was going for the full scholarship. So the full scholarship would mean uh, they don't give you a stipend, but they give you food and you get accommodation in the university. But at a moment of doubting myself, I changed it to partial scholarship, so they covered all my tuition fees. Um, yeah, I, if someone took me back, maybe right now with a bit of audacity, I'd put in full scholarship. Maybe I'd have gotten it, but what I got was pretty good too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you for sh sharing and shout mm -hmm. out to your sister. And Yay. Yeah, the power power of influence. Like people around us, siblings, friends, they do influence us a lot. They mm -hmm. can push you or they can en enhance your light or dim it. So shout out yeah. to sister. Let's go to, uh, but before we exit USIU, there is a trip you did. Do you mind sharing about about the trip and, 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 and just reflection, reflections on how it kind of opened you up? It opened your mind up to more possibilities. Yeah, certainly. So, and there's a uh, annual trip that happens within the university. It's been in it's it's been a traditional thing for a while now. It's called the Harvard Model United Nations. I'd heard about it in my first year. Didn't pay attention. Second year, I had friends who are now influencing me. Friends who actually did go, and I remember attending the meetings, and I'm like, oh, I hear that time. They're saying 300, deposit 50,000, 300. The trip would cost you about 300K. And I remember looking and saying, oh my God, how do we do this? 
So one time walking to church, I mentioned to my mom and she, I know it was coming from a point of love, but she put me off. Like she was like, ah, yeah, that's too much. That's too much. Like we don't even have land, land that we can sell to get that. <laughs> that's, uh, she said things like that. And I remember I felt disheartened and kept quiet about it. So I had already made a deposit, like crazy faith. I'd made a deposit, um, like a little bit towards the deposit, little bit towards the registration, which was like, I think 2000 or 3K. Yeah, that went that way and I forgot about it. But during that time, I applied for my, I applied for my passport. First time I applied for my passport, I reached out to an aunt of mine who's been really influential, shout out to her and she paid like I remember writing emails. Now again, friends, four of influencer friends. My friend Venus Vincentia, sorry, who uh, we were running out of the streets together with. I remember she like she pushed me to writing the emails, and I felt like I could fundraise to make the money. So got an aunt who pay, who gave me cash. I paid for my passport. Um, I remember when I went to get my passport, and someone asked me, "Where are you traveling to?" That time I've already decided I'm not going for the Harvard trip. I remember looking at her boldly and saying, I'm going to America. And she was like, what are you going to do in America? And I was like, I'm going to attend the Harvard Modern United Nations. And then afterwards, and I'm walking, I'm asking myself, surely, surely, why did you lie? And I was like, hey, I didn't lie. I didn't just put an ear, like an ear date to it. I'll go eventually. Anyway, long story, same next year. I meet a professor who becomes a mentor to me. Um, and he brings up the idea and he's like, Ruth, you're really brilliant. Like you'd make a good delegate. Uh, and I was like, ah, that cash cannot raise it. And I was like, ah, 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 we'll do it. And then, so he calls me and my friend uh, Dan to his office and he says, a well-wisher has asked me to give you this cash. So he gives wow. us hundred pounds, hundred dollar note. And <laughs> to date, I think the well-wisher was him. So... That's it's crazy how hundred dollar notes from three thousand dollars trip made me feel this is happening. So our VC dedicated to paying half the trip. Um, wait, did they pay half the trip? I can I, my mind forgets. I need to remind myself. But I got people who paid. Not so many people actually. I didn't have to fundraise a lot. Um, I only fundraised for my visa, which was about eighteen thousand Kenyan shillings. Uh, my mom uh, finally seeing all this happen like she took a loan for me for my for my for 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 bits of the money like 50k um an uncle came in and gave me my pocket money um yeah and that's how we stepped into boston for the first time and today boston remains a very beautiful place and a very special place in my heart it changed my world view yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for sharing. I think. Um, do do you do you think even the idea of uh, the idea of applying for scholarships to go for masters abroad, do do you think the trip to Boston kind of ignited that that idea of 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 going out of Kenya at some point? Very much so. Um, I was open. I was not like limited to Europe only. So, I I wanted to go even if to South Africa. I by that time I'd already applied for the Mandela Road Scholarship. Had gotten towards mm -hmm. until the last step, but didn't make it through. Um, mm -hmm. but the trip contributed in the following ways. Um, I met so during the Modern United Nations, you are in Caucasus with. Um, like uh, people from different universities, so call it Hill, um, some from the UK, some from Harvard. And for me, it was the way, like we're all young, 20, 21, 20, and we're out there like fully dressed in like official and people spending their nights just thinking and like, you know, you're trying to emulate and reenact the UN and solve world issues. And I remember saying, ah, 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 ah. I remember first feeling out of place and feeling like I don't have what it takes to like be at par with these people. But I remember leaving, by the time I came back to Kenya, leaving the place and feel, feeling I want to be able to match up. I want to be able to stand on a global stage and feel that I have what it takes to contribute. So that's where my journey to graduate school started. 
Also, after the trip, I was tasked with uh, documenting um, the trip since it started. So I wrote a report. And during the report, I had to interview people who had done the trip for the first time. And that's how I met two people who had studied in Oxford. And one of them was actually happy to meet me. Uh, a beautiful thing is they were both in Kenya. They were both happy to meet me. So we met with one of them. And at the other, we had a call because they were not, they were traveling. And I remember them telling me their story, telling me what GPA they had. And I was like, wait, you guys' profile sounds like mine. Like, I can also do this. And they were so encouraging. They sent me the documents. One father took me out for breakfast. And she further introduced me to, like, more resources and when I finally got shortlisted for Roots Scholarship, they introduced me to other Roots Scholars who'd gotten the scholarship to talk to. So lots of synchronicity. And um, if there's a reflection I have is sometimes you just have to take the first step and the other steps show up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I encourage my students, the students that I mentor, I encourage them to take even local trips, like just take a bus somewhere to another mm -hmm. country never gone to or even regional i think east africa community we don't need even a passport to travel yeah but i yeah. normally encourage my students to manifest like mm. to just get the passport you never know like just apply for that passport and yeah. then take yourself on a weekend trip to dar to kampala to kigali it, it's just a way of just op opening up your mind and the synchron yeah. synchronicity thing you say. Yeah, synchronicity. Yeah, one yeah. thing will lead to another. And yeah. and I think just uh, I've come to really appreciate the power of traveling or really taking yourself out of, out of your comfort zone, uh, be it location-wise or anything. Yeah, but even, even starting from geographical location, like just taking a bus trip to somewhere you've never gone to. Um, and it has, a, it has a way of opening things up or changing how you look at things. So thank you exactly. for that. So let's move, let's change things and move to road scholarship and your journey towards UK, uh, in particular Oxford. And that is where you, that is a, where you and I actually met. Do you remember the mm -hmm. first we, called, we, we talked on phone? Yeah, we talked, we talked uh, after I'd been shortlisted, right? Yes. Yeah. So I remember a friend again telling me, okay, so what you, like I had people, I think people who've always been in my journey, you know? So she was like, go online, search on LinkedIn, look at people who've gotten the scholarship before. And I go online and they say, Gladys, get teach. I reach out to her and she responds and you respond. And I remember you telling me, uh, give me your number, I think, and... I gave you my number and you called me directly. I was doing a project at with one of the uh, at for one of our out of the streets foundation project uh, events, and I remember you called me and I, I remember looking for a quiet space to sit down and we talked. We talked for it was almost like two hours and yeah, and I don't know like the rest is history. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you're really encouraging. If there's one thing that stood out for me was embracing authenticity, even as I approached the interviews, and that really took me far. So, again, synchronicity. Yeah, yeah. you were genuine and honest, and you mm -hmm. volunteered that you were scared and anxious, and it reminded yeah. me of how I was feeling on mm -hmm. that day when, when I was preparing for the interview. But even before we get there, how did you know about road scholarship? Uh, and because I know this year, road scholarship, and also define, um, define because I, I also got the road scholarship, but this is not my show, it's we are spotlighting you. So, define what is this road scholarship, and also, I think this is an opportunity because you are an ambassador, East African ambassador, yeah. For scholarship. Yeah. So, what the heck is this thing? And in, in Kenya, particularly, they select two students every year. So just mm -hmm. to, I want you to wear your ambassador's role and talk yeah. about scholarship in general uh, in the beginning. And then we will shift gears and then you will take us back to when you were applying. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. So as you've mentioned, I am currently one of the Rhodes East Africa 
ambassadors and my role entails um, conducting outreach in universities in East Africa and sharing with students and prospective applicants more about the Rhodes Scholarship, what it is, what, what the application process looks like, almost demystifying this scholarship, which sometimes feels inaccessible. Yeah, so uh, through my work, I travel to different universities. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm open if someone would be keen for me to visit the universities, they just should, should reach out to me. Um, so I visit a couple universities, meet students, share. And I think that's how opportunities are normally learned, by just hearing other people talk about them. And I think the ambassador role there, the fact that I did the scholarship myself, I got the scholarship and I studied in Oxford here, uh, adds to it. So the Rhodes Scholarship uh, has, of course, as you can hear from the name, as you can tell from the name, is named after Cecil Rhodes, um, a man who has an interesting and um, contradictory um, past and background. So he owned um, a, a, biz a, a diamond business uh, in Rhodesia, what's now Zimbabwe and southern southern in southern Africa and really controlled the market there, really a colonialist. And by the time of his death, he bequeathed like left a uh, left left a uh, left a will in which he contributed a lot of cash towards the founding of the scholarship. And the initial goal of the scholarship was to fund young white men to come into Oxford and get uh, an amazing and the best training so that they could go and further expand and grow the territories, yeah, the colonies. Anyway, a lot has happened since 1919, 19, early 1900s when this scholarship was founded. And right now we have women, we have black people, we have Africans who are part of the scholarship and it's changed in terms of its objective. I know it has um, like a contradictory founder, but um, the amount of work that the scholars have gone ahead to do is incredible. Uh, the scholarship grants you two years funding to come into Oxford to study anything of your choice. There's limits, though, very little limits on what you cannot study, um, but it's for graduate study. And the two years, you can do either two masters, so what I did, or like Gladys, like you you did, uh, came in directly to do a PhD, of which they'll fund uh, like the extra year, depend depending on which field you're coming from. Yeah, I hope that gives an overview. And they have an age limit, though. That's the only catch with the Root Scholarship. You need not to have turned 25 by the time you're making an application. But there is exemptions for different study and also different backgrounds. Um, yeah. How did you get to know about it? And then walk us just briefly um, through the journey of applying and getting shortlisted and then winning the scholarship in, was it 2018? 2017. 17. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you win it one year before you join. Yeah. 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 So I learned about the Road Scholarship through a website called Opportunities for Africans. I think it showed up on my Facebook. I still once in a while go in to check what opportunities are there. Actually, mm -hmm. that's how I got some of my traveling gigs mm -hmm. um, and events when I was in undergrad. So I up and I said there. Sorry, Ruthie. How did you? How did you? How did you know about the the link, the website, opportunities for Africans? Friends. There's a friend who shared it with me. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. so surrounding yourself with uh, friends who who share good information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go on. Sorry. So no no worries. So I see it and I'm like hmm. That time I was still, I was looking. So here's the thing. When you're looking, you'll certainly find what you're yeah. looking for and many yeah. other things you're not looking for. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. yeah. so I, I see it and I'm like, huh, okay. Like the, uh, the, until then I knew Oxford as like, you know, the, 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 the set, the mathematical set and the dictionary. I hadn't thought of Oxford, um, in the UK. Yeah. yeah. And so I see it, and then at the same time, that's when I'm writing this report. 
And at the same time, that's when I'm speaking to people who've gone to Oxford. Again, for me, I don't think some things happen by mistake. I think they're divine and also... And that's that's when I get scared of not starting because when you don't start, you'll not trigger the things to happen. Anyway, let me move from my explaining side. So I see that at the same time I'm doing this uh, research for the Harvard Model United Nations, I meet two students who studied in Oxford. So it's becoming real, you know? They're confirming that this thing actually happens. When I mention to them, they say, ah, oh, it's slightly competitive, but tell me, what GPA did you have? And they're like, yeah, 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 send in an application. You have what it takes. So I mentioned to my mentors, I had the power of networks also. Uh, that's something I'm slowly going back to. So I mentioned to two of my professors who are really invested in me and in my intellectual growth and academic work. So I mentioned to them, I write serious emails to them and I'm not serious, but I tell them, oh, I found these opportunities and I was requesting whether you can write me a recommendation letter. So the deadline for Rhodes tends to be August, the last day of August. And I think I was sending this to them in April, April of 2017. So letting them know early on that I'd be asking for recommendations. I gave up almost 20 times when I was making the application. First, I didn't tell many people that I was applying. I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell them. I only told <laughs> one friend and my mentors. Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't um, you share with people? Why didn't I share with people? That you are sometimes, applying. Sometimes I think I want to try out things in silence um, before letting them out. And it's something I'd slowly lost sight of, but right now I'm going back to. Um and it's not like I'm closing everybody off, these specific people I let into. And there's a book I'm reading right now. It's called, I've been reading for a while. It's called The Artist Way by Julia Cameron. She talks of wet blankets. So wet blankets are, I don't know whether you have ever had this, like, you know, you wreck a moment, like, hey, 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 I want to write this. I want to write this article. And then you tell someone, like, no. That cannot work. Yeah. I know of someone who tried it out and it did not even work. And they're telling you of someone who tried it out, not them. And <laughs> your idea dies like that. <laughs> I know. I, I once told yeah. someone I want to write a book. And yeah. they, knew, they knew my story of not reading because I started read, reading, like I mentioned, late in 2017. Yeah. And I think I was, yeah. sharing, I was telling them in 2019. So it had been mm -hmm. like, it was barely two years. Yeah. into in culture and I and I was already psyched and I wanted to write a book and they mm. told me there is no way you can write a book if you're not a reader and and my spirit just yeah uh, but anyway uh, thankfully I think the the urge to write the book was really strong and mm. it kind of it kind of abated or mm -hmm. other person uh, switched off that light but the light mm. came back came back later mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the help of other friends who are be, who are more encar encouraging, and so I think mm -hmm. I can uh, now have two books, maybe mm -hmm. more on the on the pipeline, and so I yeah. relate the wet blanket thing. So go on. Yeah, uh, exactly. So uh, as you mentioned, you have people who like maybe the moment you mentioned about writing the book, like they flew with you, you know, and not in a way that chokes you out. So yeah. I look out for such people. And sometimes you do it through trial and error. Sometimes you'll not know people are wet blankets blankets at, and, and, until you try. Yeah. For example, I don't know what... I forget the name she calls of people who are not wet blankets. I'll call it a warm blanket. I think for me, not blanket. Blanket brings in the choking idea. But for me, people who nourish my some of my ideas, for example, are my sister. And every time I want to make like... um a big plunge financially or when it comes to taking care of myself I call my sister and I'm like I want to buy this thing and she's like go for it you know <laughs> and yes yeah. sorry I can already picture her voice and 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 how impactful that would be when you hear yeah. that yeah go for it you know and um yeah, so, for example, if if it's a job I'm applying for or something, these friends who I reach out to and I know they'll literally hold my hand till the end, you know? So um, 
and I also want to do the same for others. So I think we are talking about roads. Uh, I, that's why I, I didn't mention it to so many people because mm-hmm. first I'd been applying for job. Like I had just, I was graduating. I was mm-hmm. going to graduate. That's April. I'd finished my studies. I was graduating that September. So um, I was I was in a state of precarity, like not aware of what, what my next is going to look like. Uh, I was feeling quite despondent also because things weren't lining out, lining up for me the way I thought they would. Anyway, so I was staying with my grandmother at that time, and uh, I had my own. She, she, till today, like she creates a room for me uh, when I go, and she say like I put a table for you, and all this. So I used to work interestingly. She had she has these nice cups, you know, the olden ones that the, the from long long time ago. So I'd make really strong coffee for myself, yeah, and I'd spend I'd work into the night reading, exploring, searching as much as I can about roads, and then develop, develop. It took me time to write. I'm a slow writer. Um, so it took me time to develop that. And then uh, during the days I'd sleep and she was understanding of my, of my, of my routine. But these days, these months I gave up on roads. Like these months I'd go without looking at the application. Maybe that was the beauty of starting early. But it's these people who are told, my mentors would be like, hey, when did you say you need to write that letter? And <laughs> I'd wake up again and start writing, 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 writing. So that was my process. And but so I... Why were you losing Why why, why were you losing focus with it? Was it like, did, did you feel like you didn't, uh, you didn't have what it takes to, to be a scholar? Uh... I felt like I had what it takes in terms of grades and all that, but it was like, is it worth going for? Um, I I never knew someone who was a road scholar before. So I was almost moving with ignorance and not knowing, I didn't know how big the road scholarship was. Um, so I didn't have that pressure. So like, oh, you know, this thing is massive. Like many, this is uh, thousands of people apply for it and they don't get it. So I think I didn't have that anxiety. So sometimes I just get tired because, again, it calls for lots of self-reflection and introspection to be able to develop really strong uh, letters. And it like I had to do lots of uh, academic research also for me to come up with a strong case for why refugee studies or why um, the field I was going into. So I gave up okay. a couple of times. That's... Yeah. All right. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so then, then slowly, slowly, yeah, you I get submit. Going. Yeah, I submit on thirty first. We have thirty first of August. Thirty first like of August. Side? Yeah. Okay. That's when my personal statement was ready. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All and right. I graduate the next month. October, I get shortlisted. November, I do the interview. That's when I, my parents knew. They're like, what is this? Like, and I was yeah. like, because I used to just like checking my Gmail once in a while. <laughs> and oh, I, after this, I need to open my email and check the message I received. Mm-hmm. And they're like, wait. And so the celebration, I remember going to bus station, bus station to buy like, you know, secondhand clothing. My mom had yeah. bought me this nice pencil skirt, like a black one. I bought some nude shoes like heels my sister had bought me a handbag my first handbag and probably my last i've not had a handbag in a while <laughs> uh for my graduation I, I bought a coat a gray one and uh a, 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 a top that i put inside so i i washed this thing this clothes and had them hanged waiting for my interview at that time i was talking to people like you uh, who really psyched me up and prepared my mentors also. Yeah, day, the next day um, I get the call that I'd been selected and the journey towards preparing for Oxford started. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So ju- I do want us to go deeper in it because yeah. I, I would like I would like us to talk about the technicalities, the how to write those essays for someone like me, I, I really hesitated a lot because 
I could talk about my story and I could persuade you to give me the scholarship. But if you told me to write it in words, I couldn't. And I struggled mm. a lot. So one of these, in one of the episodes I, down the line, we'll, we'll, we'll have a technical session where we talk about cover letter, uh, motivation yeah. essay, and, and things to, to, to consider, including to, for, you to, to, for the essay to be persuasive and all those things. But for, for, for students who, who would like to try or who are considering, already applying actually this year, give me top three ad pieces of advice you would give them. As they, I think you, you already talked about starting early. As early, mm -hmm. as, as early as now, maybe. Like thinking about it, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two other things you, 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 on top of your mind, you, you, you would give, assuming, assuming there is, think of this student from USIU who is planning to apply this year. What will you tell them? Yeah, start early. Um, so by watching a video such as this or listening to a podcast such as this um, and while you hear other people who've gotten the scholarship, talk of the experience, such online, have conversations with your mentors and your networks and your people who root for you. Um, and then, so networks, conversations, early conversations, uh, lots of research, I'd say. Um, and the other thing would be just getting getting started um one of my friends was really helpful with sharing resources i remember her telling me buy a journal and dedicate that journal to applications and so when you wake up in the middle of the night and you remember something when you did when you were two and you got an award for it, you write it down <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so anyway it helps with like doing lots of introspection because because it's out of all those things you'll be writing and reflecting on that you'll develop your statement of purpose and personal statements from yeah yeah amazing no i like that because i think if when you sit down assuming you leave it to the end and you you have a lot of pressure and it's so hard to flash out those important moments in your life mm -hmm. Things mm -hmm. that you need to communicate in the essay, like something that mm -hmm. things that make you who you are or like authentically mm -hmm. you. And it's mm -hmm. so hard to like come up with all those things in one sitting. So I, I like mm -hmm. the idea of having a journal and starting early so that you flash out those moments. Let's talk about Oxford. What was your first master's degree at Oxford? And were you sure you wanted to pursue that master's or it's something, how, how did you choose? How did you land on that master's degree? Yeah, so my first master's is in refugee and forced migration studies. How did I land on this? Uh, again, it was an interest and curiosity that was built during my undergraduate, um, having done a class called Contemporary Issues in Africa and Displacement Is. And protected displacement is a contemporary issue. So that's how I landed on it. And yeah, my second master's, sorry, I'm preempting the question you asked me, was in African studies. No. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. African yeah. studies um, was a continuation of my interest in displacement, but adding in youth. So I've really been in interested in just understanding as much as I can about African youth and uh, what we have to offer. Yeah. When I go back to the moment when I was preparing to go to Oxford, it was like Oxford was daunting. Like just thinking of, thinking about the fact that I'll be starting my studies at Oxford. And I think by that time, as you said earlier, um, even in my case, the only thing I knew about Oxford, I didn't know anyone who had gone to Oxford. The only thing I knew about Oxford was maybe Oxford English Dictionary in high school. When you were preparing to go to Oxford, how... How are you feeling? Uh, I don't know that to be right to say I was in ecstasy. Oh, that sounds like a wrong word to use. I was in a sense of excitement. Like, okay. Yeah. And if someone was to take me back, I'd, I'd, I'd double, I'd slightly reduce the excitement and bring in reality. Yes. I should, yeah. One of my profs had, had told me, read, start preparing early. Okay. I should have done that. Yeah. Is it like start preparing for the course you do or start preparing for the life there? I'd say you can only prepare so much for the life here because 
you have to leave and come here because it's a different environment. You can't simulate what Oxford will be in Nairobi, um, but there's some things you can preempt. You can't you can't simulate what navigating um, racism or navigating being a minority would look like um, back in Nairobi. It's slightly hard, but you can. I think you can simulate what intellectual rigor might look like yeah i should have written okay. more i should no. have read more i should have joined more research groups when i was in nairobi but yeah and in retrospect maybe that explains my work right now yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all right all right Th- that makes a lot of sense so just briefly um because now I, I want to know i want to know what 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 are some of the moments that stood out during your time in Oxford? The study process itself, the classes, um, as I said, before I joined and also my first year, I was like in cloud nine. I was walking in a trance. <laughs> um, that stood out for my for me. Also the, the beauty of the place, um, the beauty of people I met here, I think, I met more groups of diverse Africans here than I'd ever met anywhere. It's interesting that I had to come to UK to meet them here. Um, uh, networks stand out for me. And I think there's so much. I think I can write lots of essays on what stood out for me and what keeps on standing out for me from here. But for me, it's networks and people and the experience itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So at this point, I want to. So there, there is there is this there is this topic that I've been curious about a lot a lot of late. Um, we co-wrote a piece with a friend about fear and failure and importance of talking about our failures because I think when we share our stories, the story is powerful. And I think for a student listening to this, they are like, I cannot relate. Like these guys, uh, they know what they are doing and all those things which is wrong. And so I want us to talk, and I chose Oxford purposely because I think that is most recent educational or institutional um, place where you were. Do you mind sharing um, some, and anything around failure or, fe- or fear or feeling like an imposter? Did you ever, did you ever feel like an imposter while, while at Oxford? Or you could share about that or share about moments where you failed. I think that's a very good question and one worth talking about. And I think we present a, we present a, 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 an incomplete, um, incomplete image if we fail to talk about, if we do not talk about like the laws. And as I'm listening to you, I find myself uh, feeling a bit squamish with the use of failure the term failure, and I realize maybe it's no longer a vocabulary in my, like, like my, like my dictionary of language that I use. Um, maybe detour or just changes, maybe changes, yeah. Uh, and someone might be listening and saying, ah, she's trying to rationalize and condition <laughs> her mind. Yeah, it works yeah. for me. Okay, um, for me, I'll redefine it as what are the detours for me? Like, what were the things I had not expected um, that ended up happening for me? And in retrospect, I think of it as nervous breakdown. So my first year, I grappled with, uh, not I grappled with, I had a nervous breakdown. And uh, I read a beautiful quote. I wish I had my journal here where I could open it and say, sometimes a nervous breakdown is just a way that your body is speaking to you. Um for like and it's warnings that it would have given you earlier but you do not you fail to listen to them so i think the pressure um first this is a new country you're living in um you, there's a pressure of you of being the first person uh, so like the first person was doing it in, in from your family in your community so uh, i normally joke with my friends i had i had almost 30 people take me to the airport when i was coming to the uk <laughs> Thirty people, like almost yeah. thirty people, the entire and village, the entire village, you know. Yes. So, yes. 
so like when when I when I'd be sitting down and I'm writing an essay and it's just just coming up. It's not an essay just for me. It's my it's an essay for Kenya. It's an essay for Nairobi. <laughs> Yeah. For the people who brought me to the airport, you know, yeah. all those 30 people. Yeah. So there's that, this pressure which I imagine that other people are putting on me. There's a pressure I was putting on myself. Man, I was a perfectionist. I think it's slowly, I'm slowly figuring it out. So I wanted my things to look a certain way. I wanted to read all the 20 articles um, for all the three classes. So adding that almost adds to 50 articles and no human. I think with chat GPT right now, at least I can read that much papers because <laughs> I'll ask it to summarize for me. Yeah. <laughs> Pick up the key arguments for me. <laughs> so that was me yeah. out here trying to do so much than my 22-year-old body could handle. And um, I stopped eating well. I stopped I did not incorporate exercising. So I was taking care of this. There's a friend and a mentor who says, I was taking care of my head. I forgot my body. And that mm. doesn't work. Yeah. One mm. thing we'll have to give. So, yeah. Um, that definitely influenced how fast I could finish things, how best I could do things. Um, yeah. So that was the major, I think, one of the major detours for me. I've since had a couple of detours, but it's more of like, well, we tried. We learned, yeah. We now figured out how to figure uh, to to move past that, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I I I I love this. If you were to, if if someone is, so someone who is preparing, someone who is preparing. We met uh, the new road scholars recently, right? Someone who is currently packing their their bags and they are preparing to start their studies abroad. Um, with the power of hindsight. What is just one just one piece of advice you would give them? I think for me, I'd say um, first, always be be super grateful. It's such a huge uh, achievement. Uh, don't lose sight of that. But I'd say embrace uh, a spirit of learning and a spirit of curiosity, curiosity, creativity. Learning here is on steroids. <laughs> Yeah, because like a master's course is like nine months, which uh, ideally should be like two years. So it's on steroids, you know. I'd say embrace, embrace a power of flexibility, the power of flexibility and learning. Yeah, don't don't beat up yourself. Yeah, yeah, too much. Be kind to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know I embrace everything Gen Z. I, 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 not everything. I value some Gen Z tenants. So like your mental health is key. Mm -hmm. Self-care is key. Whatever self-care means for you. (laughs) I'm not advocating for therapy only. Different things mean therapy for people. So, um, but I think the best thing I'd say is learn how to work together with your body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Learn to work together with your body. So we've talked about we've talked about those. I don't want to say those details. Let, let's let's call it um, details. Then um, the highlights. And I, what are the highlights? So I do want to pre- pre- preempt, but I know you 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 got um, UK. You were named UK Rare Rising Star at some point. Yeah. Yeah, one of the highlights. What are some of the highlights during your time uh as a grad student? Um yeah, you mentioned the rare rising star, which I celebrate in retrospect. It's an award that is given to top ten black students, um, either Africans or people with African like heritage studying and living in the UK, graduate level. And who were doing really incredible stuff. I got it in the year 2019. I came fifth place of the 10 incredible individuals who were recognized. I remember when I got it, I dissociated from the award. I couldn't believe, I, I didn't allow myself to think of myself as a rare rising star. But and what? now that I'm talking about why, Yeah, it's because... I don't know whether it's imposter and maybe the nervous breakdown. 
like it sort of took me to a place of lack of self belief and lack of reduced confidence. It took a while to relearn how to have that confidence because you're like the people who see it will know like I didn't get a distinction with my first masters. That's mm-hmm. the thing. You come to Oxford, there's also like A plus plus plus. I was like my classmates will see this and they'll know like or even my professors will see this and they'll be like but that girl struggles with her essays. Anyway, right now Yeah I am I'm embracing it unapologetically. Yeah. You sh- I think they saw something in me. I might not see it, but they saw something in me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My mm. other highlights has been friendships. So friendship with you, friendship with other incredible humans. And and I was telling a friend this morning that the beauty with this place is the networks that you build are not like networks only during the period that I studied here. Like they're continuous. The fact that I studied here and was part of communities here means that I'll be able to build further communities from them wherever I go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a greatest highlight for me. Mm-hmm. And of course, graduating with two masters from Oxford. Mm-hmm. Again, my mind doesn't let it settle so much. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But I, I've heard from people that it's uh, uh, an achievement. Yeah, I, I, I think it is because yeah. I mean, I, I, and these are master's degrees from Oxford. Two of them at twenty-five. I don't think many people have done or uh, have been able to to get that. So you sh- think you should be proud of yourself. I cannot close without speaking about top two things that I know you're really passionate about. We had talked about writing. Do you want to share a little bit about your blog, and then? share about your mountaineering interests oh, about the blog so i am a struggling writer <laughs> for those who watch one day the series the limited british series um you know emma when like how emma really struggled before she got to her writing that's me and for mountaineering that's definitely uh, uh, an interest that has grown or uh, it's pretty recent i only got into it in 2021 and i hope to further do more i i look forward to making a second attempt at um kenya's highest peak at some point um soon so that's batian um it's a technical climb that has both has majority rock climbing and it's it's a mental exercise as much as it's a physical exercise. And for me, mountaineering has been a space of growth, a space of release, and a space of resilience. Mm-hmm. Telling, challenging my body to do more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So lastly, three last things that I want to ask, um, or rather I'll be asking every guest. The first one is, I'm calling it a better world. And I'm asking, what is one thing you find very wrong in the world? If you had all the powers, you would change. I'd say many things, but let me pick one. I think I've been reflecting a lot lately on expression, full expression. And it takes me back to childhood. It hurts me to know that there's a child who will grow without and it's many children or many young people who grow without a nurturing space uh, or spaces that will enable them to know to play to be children to explore to, uh, to, to 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 explore the full range of what they can become the second one is this concept that i've come to love and i think it's been shaping most of my decisions and it's mm-hmm. this concept they call anticipated regret. And it's this concept that every time you want to do something, you ask yourself, if I was going to die next year, if I was going to die in five years, would I be doing or planning to do what I'm about to do now? I, and I think if, when you ask that question, most of the time, the answer is I would not be doing what I'm doing. I'll be doing something else. So I'm curious to know. God forbid, but if you were to die next year or five years from now, 
what is one thing that you would regret not having done? Oh man, <laughs> I feel shy. <laughs> I okay. don't know whether <laughs> talk about talk about the why are you shy. I don't know whether I want to expose myself. <laughs> okay, you can. Is there something that is that is less uh, vulnerable that you can share? Okay, I'll make it general. Okay. I'll be I'll regret not allowing myself to imagine or become or try out what I think I should be trying out. Yeah. I will not probe more. <laughs> Thank you. And the third one, the third one is a giveaway. Mm-hmm. And here just to uh, show appreciation to our supportive community. We call them the GN Inspired Tribe. And so just a giveaway to our, or, or a member of our tribe. Do you, any, anything you want to give away? Um, I think so. Okay. I, yeah, I, I value, I personally value just a space, a space where I'm able to come and express myself and have someone ask me probing questions. Uh, I've had my professional coach do that to me and shout out to Nyachomba Karaoke. Um, happy to share the link and you can check her out on Instagram. Like she holds the space for me to just explore my career trajectory, to explore my creativity and to explore other things I'm thinking about. And this is an attempt at doing the same for someone else. I'd be happy to have like um, one hour sessions, um, maybe four of them with someone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that is so nice. Uh, thank you so much, Ruthie, and really appreciate the time you've taken to uh, chat with us about um, school, career, and life. And that is it for today. See you in the next episode. 